It emanates from the social order, more or less deliberately designed by individuals themselves. Recognition of these conventional inequalities right for the scope of review of the basis of social distinctions and to restructure social positions according to the new concepts of social justice. Thus, in the French Revolution, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen expressed as far back as in 1789 that man, men are born free and equal in rights. Social distinctions can be based upon only public utility. So born you may be equal. But your inequality comes out of your utility. And this is a, another facet that troubled me when I was working at this lecture. And I was reading a joke where this mechanic had opened a car engine and was removing the cylinders. <coughs> Just as he was doing that, a very prominent heart surgeon came there. This mechanic says, Doctor, can I ask you a question? He says, Sure. He says, Doctor, look at this engine. I opened its heart. I took the valves out. I fixed them up and put them back. And when I am finished, the car is as good as new. How come? The mechanic asks the doctor. I get such a small salary. And you? get such a fat salary, whereas you and I are really doing the, just the same thing. So when you talk about <coughs> equality and inequality, you must also understand the public utility of what your worth is, because you are going to be weighed in public in society by your work. So there is so much inequality commencing from your birth, commencing from your traits and what you do for a living. And then dealing with all these issues and expecting and claiming equality. That's the big issue. Our freedom fighters, sorry. So, this facet of equality apart than the other three connotations. Because in my view, equality has enormous complications. Without freedom, there can be no equality or fraternity. So, freedom walks into equality. And without equality, freedom, fraternity and liberty cannot exist. Each of these values constitutes the other two. And none of them can sustain in isolation. Each of them contribute towards the other's values. And each of them become a cause and consequence for the other. Liberty, equality and fraternity are not statues to worship, but these are inseparable facets of the same origin and these constitute the origin of dignity.
So when you seek equality and you seek fraternity and you seek justice, what you're really seeking is dignity, which is truly an amalgam of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and together are responsible of giving rise to a legitimate social order. Our freedom fighters had cherished many aspirations in their dreams during the arduous course of the freedom movement. Having attained independence, the Indian nation was passionate about making a fresh start. In a form and system of a government substantially different from that of the alien rulers, the arrival of political freedom gave impetus to the drafting of the Indian Constitution, which was objectified on the 26th of January 1950. The Constitution of India is not a mere set of fundamental principles that form the basis of governance, but it is the personified reflection of certain basic ideals, philosophical thoughts and goals that were cherished by those who suffered foreign subjugation. Federalism, separation of powers, constitutionalism, rule of law and the like are at the heart of the Indian Constitution. The Indian Constitution also comprises of fundamental concepts constituting its basic structure which contribute meaningfully towards the achievement of liberty, equality, order, justice and fraternity. The first ever initiative in India to deal with inequality was taken when the state attempted to alleviate the misery of the downtrodden. That's the first time. In a society like ours, accomplishing the objective of social justice and equality, as is enshrined in the Constitution, is a difficult political task. The Constitution made the state a trustee to preserve, protect, defend and uplift the backward classes within the confines of the constitutional principles. The government, on considering the recommendations of the Mandal Commission, apropos the benefits to be extended to the socially and educationally backward classes, acknowledged that certain weightages needed to be extended to such classes in matters of employment under the state and other public undertakings. This endeavor met with mass resistance from the larger upper class of society. The state enactment to extend such weightages was considered by a nine-judge bench of the Supreme Court. In the Indra Sani case, several shades of opinion ranging from one extreme to the other were presented before the court. For my own benefit and for your benefit, I had thought I will deal with those issues, but I think in the scenario that we are today, I need not read that to you probably when the paper is published, you will get to know the intricate aspects of this limited issue. Assuaging the rights of the downtrodden. But that's the first equality, inequality that was attempted to be addressed. And the Supreme Court, taking a cue from the observations of Dr. Ambedkar, declared in that case, in the Rasani, that 27% reservation to other backward classes was constitutionally valid, but with certain restrictions. The policy has been 
mine. This is mine. The policy has, in, has been in place for as long as we have been independent. We have made reservations for government posts and posts in public sector for these downtrodden. But even after 70 years, they remain where they were. They are still the caste that they were. And still the reservation goes on because the purpose is yet to be achieved. And therefore, I suggest, and I desire you to consider in your discourse during your deliberations, the urgent need for more pragmatic parameters. The urgent need to look at political disturbances created by some class or classes of society. Disturbances created by minorities and other sections. Which possibly come out of the fact that they feel left out. And it's this aggression which we need to focus on and not ignore. Assigning by assigning the uprising to other societal differences. Now what is the focus that I suggest strictly within the confines of the constitution? It's not a thought that I have invented. It's not my thought. But it's a thought which I have been greatly attracted to. A change in the meaning of desire to equality. A change from equality of rights to equality of outcome. This would transform the function of governance from one of protection to one of redistribution. As such, there needs to be a transformation in the understanding projected by the framers of the Constitution to achieve the modern welfare state. Not only because the directive principles are now coming into a state of maturity. In this shift, the concept of justice has also undergone a transformation. It has lost its classical connotation of equality by taking on board a holistic concept of social justice. Through innovative social economic <coughs> regulation, eventually aimed at achieving justice in its true spirit. The acceptance of equality of outcome, not equal in getting the right, but equal in outcome of that right.
the acceptance of equality of outcome as the basis of legitimacy would lead to a satisfactory and holistic acceptance, acceptable outcome. When viewed from the outcome-driven model of equality, the concept of economic equality and political equality as would balance equity, fraternity and justice may have to be understood differently. Economic equality, instead of meaning open competition and the protection of an individual right to private property and the freedom of contract may have to be defined in terms of distributive justice. The focal point thus shifts from rules to results and from freedom to regulation as the state apparatus attempts to impose some predetermined pattern of income and wealth distribution. The constitutional protect perspective is therefore likely to change to a certain extent as judicial and legislative eyes turn towards the mirage of social justice. Similarly, political equality when viewed outside the ideals of the framers of the Constitution, conceived as a design of limited government, become more focused on the democratic process. <coughs> then from effectively construing the powers of government and safeguarding individual freedom, The premise of substantive protection of economic rights has eroded the economic part of the Constitution and has emphasized and expanded the size and scope of governance. The Supreme Court's reliance on the rational basis test has effectively eliminated judicial review. In the field of economic liberties, leaving the door open to all sorts of legislative intervention, which at times are responsible for brazen monetary disparities. The result can be seen from the fact that 1% of the already wealthy Indians have cornered 70% of annual national income. They constitute India's high position on the corruption index in the wealth spectrum of equality. There can be no equality without, without equality based on merit, rationally distributed between equals and unequals. When I was preparing this lecture, I went on to the internet to understand this concept of wealth being concentrated in very limited sections of society the world over. Uh, I, would, I had thought I would, I would share with you some of them, but I think I would recommend to you to get onto the internet and you'll have some beautiful answers on how and why wealth is concentrated in some people. Fraternity encompasses the spirit of brotherhood, a spirit that all are children of the same soil and of the same motherland. The term fraternity was added to the preamble on account of the diversities in, Indian, in India based on race, religion, language and culture. Fraternity is the cementing factor of all the inherent diversity. It is a relationship of a nature which links all human beings irrespective of gender and generation. 
but fraternity is not possible. Unless the dignity of each individual is preserved and mutually respected. Peaceful coexistence is the philosophy of live and let live. It entails mutual understanding, emerging out of feelings of reciprocal cooperation and an attitude to adjust and sacrifice. I'm going to come to this a little later. And an attitude to adjust and sacrifice. It can also be understood as an approach to be useful to others, aimed at being able to propagate employment and common well-being of all the diverse factions of society. The expression, to promote among them all, preceding the word fraternity in the preamble of the Indian constitution is significant in this respect. In a country like ours, with so many dis dis disruptive forces of regionalism, communalism and lingualism, it is necessary to emphasize and re-emphasize that the unity and integrity of India can be preserved only by a spirit of brother. And understanding that India has one citizenship, and an approach that every citizen is Indian first, irrespective of what, irrespective of whatever fishes others wish to create. A little while ago, I had the occasion to deliver a speech. I was not thinking I would say this today. But the tenor of the shades of impression projected before I came to speak prompt me to say the same. So I do. It was a long speech dealing with the invasion of India by so many people who came from Central Asia. It was a speech we dealt with the plundering of Indian temples and the massacre of the Indian public and then retaliation and in this retaliation pockets of revolution revolt And the invaders crushed the revolt. And when they crushed the revolt, all males above the age of eight came out. All women were enslaved. Further reactions. Eventually, the Hindus got back. The country was divided into Pakistan, a Muslim state, and into <coughs> India, which professes to be secular. I belong to Punjab. 
it saw a lot of massacre. Both in the Punjab on the India side and in the Punjab on the Pakistan side. This is history. It's difficult to forget. It's recent. But I'll tell you two instances in my life, very recent after I demitted office. And I have not demitted office now for more than six months, just about six months. I live with my mother, and my mother has visualized all this, all her life. My mother one day at the dining table told me she, she, she had a very painful tooth. And I said, we can't wait, because a tooth pain can be atrocious. So we decided to take her to a hospital. We made arrangements. We went to the doctor in charge of a government hospital. The lady attending to us called for a specialist who would deal with what her problem was. Incidentally, that specialist wasn't available. So they called somebody else. And I read her name. I told my mother, she's a Muslim. She extracted her tooth and told me, Son, God bless her. Second incident, my dog fell in. My dog is a part of, or was a part of our family as much as any of our children. So his name is Coco and he carries my surname. That's how everybody calls him. So he had to undergo a number of surgeries because he was suffering from cancer. And after one surgery, I we got him back late in the evening. And about two o'clock in the morning, he was panting very much. And I went up to him and there's nothing I can do about it. It's two o'clock in the morning. <coughs> and then my wife goes to him and he says, do something. So I said, what do I do at two o'clock in the morning? Well, I picked my car, went to the hospital. And there was this gentleman on emergency, a very beautiful wet hospital. And I said, you have to come to see the dog. He says, I'm on emergency duty and I'm not supposed to go with anybody. If somebody else comes, how do I look after him? We have an emergency service. I says, but you operated on the dog. And it's your bounden duty to look after the dog. So all the same, he spoke to his, to the, to the surgeon who had operated upon him. And the surgeon says, okay, go. So he came. He brought a lot of things with him. Some intravenous. He found that his fever had gone up tremendously. It was, I think, 108 or something. He should have died. But with the medicine that he gave him, uh, his breathing became controlled and he didn't wake up. From that state, he started to snore and everybody laughed. He was okay. 
So I asked this doctor, I says, where are you from? He says, I'm from JNK. The label on his coat said, doctor, son. So I told my mother, my mother is the patron of the house. So I says, told her, Muslim. She says, God bless him. It's this change of heart that I am now talking about to overcome those feelings of the past and to get into the reality of the future and to get the equality that we all so much desire. I thank you for your time and your patience. Thank you very much.